Auspicious greetings to all. Welcome to a new episode of Fo Guangshan English Dharma Services. I am Zhi Tong. Last week, we heard about Amitabha Buddha from Venerable Miao Xi. She explained in detail about the Amitabha Sutra, the Western Pure Land of Ultimate Bliss, and how we can cultivate. Pure Land practices. Today, I would like to share the biography of Master Hui Yuan. He is considered as the first Buddhist master to popularize Pure Land practice in China, and was posthumously honored as the first Patriarch of the Pure Land School. Master Hui Yuan was the disciple of Master Dao An. And contemporary of Master Kumarajiva, whom I have both discussed in previous Dharma talks. In this mini series, let us journey on a lotus flower and down to Master Hui Yuan's extraordinary life. Part One: Birth and Renunciation. Master Hui Yuan was born in a Jia family, around A.D. three hundred and thirty-four, in the Yanmen Commandery, which is located in present-day Shanxi, the north of mainland China. He came from a noble Confucian family, and was well educated from a young age. When he was thirteen years old. His uncle brought him along to the city of Luoyang, where he had opportunities to meet and learn from renowned scholars and literati. Such an experience enhanced his mind and education, and before long, he mastered all the classics, including the philosophy of Zhuangzi, and gained a reputation. At the age of twenty-one, Hui Yuan and his brother Hui Chi both decided to study under an eminent Confucian scholar in Jiangdong. But they were met with challenges in every direction, due to internal political unrest and external invasions. All transportation means was halted. The brothers were at lost on what to do. What would become of their future? Is there a possibility to improve themselves and perhaps secure a means of living? The battle and cries of pain and suffering did not paint a promising tomorrow. One day, the brothers chanced upon the news. That there was a renowned Buddhist monastic by the name of Dao An, who had established a temple and held regular Dharma lectures. The brothers decided to pay Master Dao An a visit, and traveled eastward, despite not knowing anything about Buddhism. After their arrival at Master Dao An's temple. The brothers were welcomed to attend the Dharma lecture, which was on the Prajna Paramita Sutra. As Hui Yuan sat listening, wonder rose within him. Never in his life had he ever heard such ideas. The concepts of form and emptiness were completely foreign to him, yet he could understand it. He could perceive that this was a level of wisdom not found in his classical studies. Hui Yuan thought to himself. After listening to the teachings of the Buddha, I now know that the thoughts of confusion and Taoism are but shells and husks. Almost immediately, Hui Yuan and his brother Hui Chi renounced as Buddhist monastics. Under Master Dao An. Part Two: Learning Under Master Dao An. 
Life at the time was extremely difficult. People were struggling with limited food and material supplies caused by the unrest. The monastic community of Master Dao An fared no better, especially Hui Yuan and Hui Chi, given that they had just become part of the community, and has lost all economic support. They barely even had clothes to help them through the winter. Despite this, the brothers made no excuses and continued their studies diligently. This touched their fellow monastic brothers, that some even spared them some money to buy candles, so that the brothers could continue their learning at night. Hui Yuan has shown extraordinary intellect and insight since a young age. Combined with his diligent nature, he was able to quickly master the Buddhist teachings, which his teacher expounded, and received recognition among his monastic companions. At the young age of twenty-four, just three years after renouncing. Master Dao An asked Hui Yuan to expound the Nirvana Sutra on behalf of him. Despite Hui Yuan's mastery in the subject matter, the foreign concepts expounded in the sutra confused his audience. Though by this time Buddhism has been slowly spreading in China for about three centuries, the many doctrines of Buddhism. Were only trickling in, depending on the arrival and translation of new Buddhist texts. Therefore, a lot of Buddhist concepts, such as emptiness and Buddha nature, are still very abstract and foreign to most people. Hui Yuan found himself questioned by his audience on such doctrines. But no matter how hard he tried to explain these concepts, it did not click with the people. Hui Yuan pondered the new ways he could explain these Buddhist concepts. He drew on his own experience and background. Suddenly, it occurred to him that he could use his knowledge of the philosophy of Zhuangzi as a means of explanation. Hui Yuan did it. And it clicked with his audience. Master Dao An was quite impressed with Hui Yuan's creative use of Chinese philosophy to explain Buddhist doctrines. He gave Hui Yuan special permission to continue studying secular books, as it aided Dharma propagation. A few years later, when Hui Yuan was about twenty-six years old. Not only was the country pulled apart by continuous internal and external unrest, a long period of drought brought about locust plagues, causing widespread famine. Pushed to the brink, Master Dao An had no choice but to take the entire monastic community with him to travel down south in search of a better location to stay. Thus began a period of seven to eight years of wandering from place to place. Though not much was said about this period, one can imagine how difficult it must be. The Sangha community of five hundred monastic had to choose the safest route to go, and to avoid cities that were undergoing battle. But what was more difficult was the pain and suffering that the country was going through. Hunger and death were found in every corner, and people lost their possessions, homes, and family members again and again. Finally, after years of moving around from one place to another. And after separating not just once, but many times, the community settled southwards 
in the city of Xiangyang, which is located in the kingdom of Eastern Jin. As most of the battles were happening up north, the southern part of China was experiencing relative peace. It was here that Master Dao An and his disciples stayed in Tanxi Temple and began the work on collecting Buddhist sutras, indexing the text, and writing commentaries on it. Furthermore, Master Dao An began to establish monastic rules and regulations. In the past, there had not been such a large-scale gathering of monastic, as the culture and way of living in China was different from that of India. Master Dao An knew that rules should be established to ensure that Buddhist monastics can come together and become a more cohesive, structured, and a harmonious community. Such a community would be a great force in propagating the Dharma and ensuring the continuity of Buddhism in China. Part 3. Departing to Mount Lu Wei Yuan stayed in Xiangyang with Master Dao An for about 15 years. He stayed by his teacher's side throughout all these endeavors. From a bright young man, Hui Yuan learned and matured into a wise monastic in the prime of his life. However, the reality of life is that everything changes. Or, to put in Buddhist terms, everything is impermanent. The 15 year of relative peace was broken when the community received news that the King Fu Jian of former Qin intended to battle southwards with the intention of capturing the city of Xiangyang. To be more specific, King Fu Jian wished to have Master Dao An in his royal court. Despite the turmoil that surrounded the country, Master Dao An's reputation had spread far and wide. His wisdom and insight would be invaluable for kings and warlords that sought to amass power. But King Fu Jian was not only looking for to conquer. As a devout Buddhist, he sincerely wished to have a great Buddhist master, such as Dao An, as a spiritual guidance. The army general in charge of Xiangyang placed Master Dao An under arrest. The general knew that if there was a chance that a city could hold, it depended on Master Dao An. Master Dao An knew he could not leave. Hence, he approached his disciples in small groups and ordered them to flee Xiangyang instead. Hui Yuan was quite ignorant about this. He only saw that Master Dao An called upon other monastics and gave them instructions. And in turn, these monastics would pack and leave the city. Day by day, his teacher did not call upon him. Hui Yuan began to feel a little desperate. What was his teacher wish for him? What hope or mission does his teacher place in him? Finally, Hui Yuan went to his teacher and knelt before him. O oh, teacher, we are facing imminent separation. You have given words to your other disciple, but have yet to call upon me. Please tell me, master, what words of wisdom what wishes do you have for me? Master Dao An smiled and said simply, I have no worries for you. Hui Yuan bowed in gratitude. He fully understood his teacher intention. Though no one was willing to part with Master Dao An, they knew 
that it was more important for them to survive and continue to teach and spread Buddhism. Hui Yuan and his brother Hui Chi, along with a few other monastics, bade farewell to Master Dao An with a full heart. They knew that this would be the last time that they would see their master again. Hui Yuan, Hui Chi, and a few other monastics traveled further south, where the riches of battles were yet to be felt. Hui Yuan wished to find a suitable place to settle so that he could start Buddhist endeavors and to be apart from political turmoils. Their southward journey eventually brought them to the foot of Mount Lu. The area was fertile. The mountains provided seclusion as well as nourishment. The weather was very comfortable year-round. It was the perfect place to settle down. As Hui Yuan climbed into the mountains, he searched for a suitable spot to construct a temple. Water was essential, not just for construction, but also for all the monastics that will be living in this place. He took his staff and proclaimed, If this is the place where I should build my temple, when I strike the ground, water will come flowing. He raised his staff and brought it to the ground. Immediately, spring water came rushing forward, an auspicious sign that Mount Lu was the place for Hui Yuan. Soon after, with the help from many people, the famous Dongling Temple was constructed. And you can still visit it today on top of Mount Lu in Jiangxi province. From then on, Hui Yuan made a solemn vow. I vow to never step food beyond Mount Lu. How does Master Hui Yuan propagate the Dharma without leaving Mount Lu? Who would come and visit him? What other contributions did Hui Yuan make towards Buddhism? And what are his connections with the Pure Land School? Find out more on next week's Dharma Talk. Thank you for listening. May you find joy and inspiration in the Dharma. Amitofo.